Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Roden, and I, my titles are on this slide, but uh, for the, in the interests of uh, this symposium, I'm one of uh, a number of organizers who you'll hear from through the day and through the day tomorrow. Um, so we're here to talk about the interface between the American Society for Human Genetics and the Pharmacogenetics Research Network. And I'm going to give you a little brief overview of the Pharmacogenetics Research Network, of which I have been a part since almost the very beginning, uh, not quite the very beginning. But, and the ASHG uh, has kindly agreed to be a, an official sponsor of this symposium. And we have a, an official session with them tomorrow afternoon. So uh, everybody thinks of pharmacogenomics as the low-hanging fruit of genomic implementation. And I like this cartoon because while it may be low-hanging fruit, it's not very simple. And as we'll hear through the day, today and tomorrow, uh, there are a number of obstacles that have to be overcome before we, uh, before we get this low-hanging fruit into the, into the uh, way in which people practice medicine. I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, how we got here and what with the history of pharmacogenetics for the, for the under 50 crowd. Um, arguably, the person who uh, first thought of the idea that variability in response to exposure to drugs or food sub substances uh, might have a genetic basis, although he didn't use the word genetic, he said inborn. Uh, was Archibald Garrett, who is famous for the term inborn errors of metabolism and one of the founders of modern, uh, I guess, metabolomics, pharmacogenomics, genetics, uh, and, uh, and such. So the first examples of that came in the 1940s uh, during World War II when uh, large numbers of African American soldiers were exposed to anti-malarial drugs in the South Pacific and developed uh, hemolytic anemia because of G6PD deficiencies. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, uh, a number of unusual familial syndromes were described in terms of drug response uh, by these two men, uh, uh, Matulski in Seattle and uh, Werner Kahlo in Toronto, focusing on uh, uh, twin studies, focusing on familial uh, aggregation of uh, drug response traits. And in particular, Kalo worked on uh, uh, succinylcholine and pseudocholinesterase deficiency as a cause of prolonged paralysis after anesthesia. Interestingly, they are both uh, German refugees that came to Canada and the United States after the Second World War. And uh, you can debate or people can argue which of them invented the word pharmacogenetics, but one of those two invented the word pharmacogenetics. Um, the, the navel of genetics at the time, uh, one of the navels was, uh, was Johns Hopkins, led by their chair med longtime chair of medicine, Victor McCusick, shown here with one of his early trainees, David Price Evans, a distinguished pharmacogeneticist, and, and their early studies of uh, polymorphic metabolism by, uh, by N-acetyl transferase. So, um, and then in the 1970s, uh, the focus turned from uh, drug uh, responsiveness to more to drug metabolism and variability in drug metabolism. And two scientists, uh, Robert Smith at St. Mary's in London and Michel Eichelbaum in Stuttgart, uh, described, or actually in Bonn at the time, described uh, variation in response to uh, drugs that no one in this room has ever heard of or used, debrisoquine and spartane, and both of those are CYP2D6 substrates, and, uh, and of course we know that CYP2D6 is one of the major players in current pharmacogenomics. So they are the, that's the early history. Now, the Pharmacogenetics Research Network started in the late 1990s as the brainchild of uh, uh, a number of people, two of whom are shown on this slide, Rochelle Long, who is going to be part of our program today, and Mike Rogers, who was a program officer at NIGMS. They created work task forces that ultimately resulted in the funding of pharmacogen the Pharmacogenetics Research Network in 2000. Part of the funding for that initially was uh, something called a knowledge base, the pharmacogenetics knowledge base, which exists to this day and, um, uh, and is currently supported by NIGMS, so a, or NHGRI. And so it's a, uh, 
uh, a continuum of support from NIH uh, through many, many years, recognizing the importance of a resource like that for uh, pharmacogenomic discovery and for pharmacogenomic implementation. Uh, the pharmacogenomics research network had many nodes, uh, each one of which focused on a different area and therapeutics, and in our case, arrhythmias, in many other, in other cases, other cardiovascular or cardiac or other cardiac or cancer phenotypes, but, and I don't really want to talk about each one of them individually, um, but one of the things that we realized after between five and ten years in was that we needed to start to work together. One of the first projects we did was generate a consortium, the International Warfare and Pharmacogenomics Consortium, which consisted of sites within the PGRN and outside the PGRN that put together about 5,000 patients with their warfarin dose requirements and their warfarin genetics. And we proposed an algorithm for treating patients that, uh, that was ultimately published in the New England Journal. And I show the uh, editorial underneath it because the editorial was written by Janet Woodcock and Larry Lesko, who at the time were at the FDA, showing that the FDA started to become interested in this idea of variable drug responses around this time, propelled in part by the work in the Pharmacogenetics Research Network. Uh, another uh, way in which the PGRN has propelled science across uh, the country and across the globe has been the creation of the Pharmacogenomics Research Network uh, CGM Global Alliance, an alliance with the Riken uh, Center for Genomic Medicine CGM in Japan. Uh, they have been responsible for supporting uh, genome-wide genotyping or more recently sequence data for uh, up to 50 drug response projects, so a real engine for discovery across the pharmacogenetics landscape. As far as I'm concerned, an important event in the life of the Pharmacogenomics Research Network was a, was a road trip that six of us took to Marshfield, Wisconsin in 2010. I show this because the person we went to visit was Mike Caldwell, and he had a farm, and on the farm he, he grows these, he grows these, he, he raises these cows called Belgian Belties. And uh, we, we got a whole lecture about Belgian Belties at dinner that night. But the point of visiting Marshfield was to think about the idea of engaging electronic health records as a tool for discovery and for implementation in uh, genomic and pharmacogenomic medicine. And I think arguably this is, the, this is where this started. Uh, and those of you who were, on the <coughs> who were on the road trip with me can argue with me or not. But it, and there's stories about the road trip we can talk about over alcohol at the poster session. That resulted in turn in the generation of a, of a working group within the Pharmacogenetics Research Network called the Translational Pharmacogenomics Program that started to think about how you would take all this information, all this wonderful data that we were generating on why people vary in their responses to drugs and actually try to translate that into action in terms of uh, taking care of patients. And one of the things that came out of that or that was part of that was the Phar Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, CPA which has become the go-to guideline in North America, at least, for, I have to say that because our Dutch friends are sitting right next to Mary right now. Yeah. It's not part of CPIC, right? <laughs> right, so the, so the idea is if you have a genetic, if you know you have a genetic variant, what should you do with it? We don't actually address the issue of should you ever find out if you have a genetic variant, that's going to come in a different place. So that's the timeline for the pharmacogenetics research network, and I think uh, uh, 20 years in, or almost 20 years in, uh, I think we can look back with pride on how we've changed the field. <clears throat> I show this picture, uh, which was taken at the very first uh, meeting with, uh, with the Yokohama group, um, mo mainly to point out that even in those early days, I have to use the mouse somehow. Maybe in the early days, we had representation from ASHG. This is Nancy Cox, who was president of ASHG two years ago. So even in the early days, there was this idea of an alliance <coughs> with the, the hardcore, I would call the hardcore genetics community, uh, or the, the dedicated genetics community, of which we were becoming a part. Uh, currently, the activities of the, of the PGRN are coordinated through the PGRN hub, whose website is shown here. You can figure out exactly when I took this screenshot, because it was, at the time, it was one day, 22 hours and 16 minutes. So it was one day, 22 hours and 16 minutes ago that I took this, this screenshot. And, and, and this is the go-to place for telling you everything about PGRN, who the members are. There are 
Kathy will tell me, will correct me, I think there are 450 or more members of the PGRN uh, across the globe. And uh, there are individual websites, there are individual projects, there are descriptions of uh, consortium activities on the, on the website. I'm Canadian, and there's a famous Canadian author called uh, Hugh McClellan. And uh, he wrote a book on uh, how French Canadians and English Canadians never talk to each other. And that book is called The Two Solitudes. And there are times when I think of the ASHG, the genetics community, and the PGRN, the pharmacogenetics community, as representing those two solitudes. We've spent a lot of time developing our own science, but not a lot of time interacting with each other. So uh, I hope that this slide gives you an idea of where I hope we're going to end up. We're going to end up as two, not two solitudes, but two highly interactive communities that talk to each other and use each other's uh, expertise and information to uh, advance uh, science in the field in, at the l discovery levels as well as the implementation levels. We held a, a joint session with ASHG two years ago. Uh, we had uh, 175 attendees at the poster session, about 300 attendees at the uh, at the main session, I, uh, I'll tell you that there are over 600 registrants for this meeting uh, today, so twice the size, and we will have uh, the poster session this afternoon. Um, the people who are responsible for organizing this include uh, the names that you see here, uh, many of whom, all of whom, all of whom are here or will be here, and I have to especially highlight Pauline and Lawrence from ASHG and from the PGRN, who really have helped us put this together, as well as our partners in Europe, the UPGX and the Stratified Medicine Network in the UK. Uh, this is the program. You all have it in front of you, so I won't bother to, to read it to you, except to say that we, are, we have two sessions today and uh, two sessions and a roundtable tomorrow. We have the poster session this evening at 545 in the sales pavilion in this building, I believe. And, uh, and that's all I have to say for now. And so I, I'll ask uh, Rochelle and Jean-Claude to come to the table to manage the first session, which is on uh, drug development. Thank you. <laughs>